We just got back from being gone for a week. We went to Boise to pick up Wade, and they had a celebration for him, uh, for the team of 15 young adults that just graduated from Vineyard College of Missions. And uh, we had a great time at the Boise Vineyard. And Boise Vineyard's about the same size as our church, and it's a wonderful church. And I just want you to know that I just came away from that thinking, you know, Canyon View is just an incredible church. And there's so much that I appreciate about being here with you guys, and I want you to know that you guys are a great church. Turn to your brother or your sister next to you and say, you are a part of a great church. Just keep reminding yourselves of that, because it really is true. And uh, I, wanted, I just want to share a little bit about us going away and, and taking a little time for a vacation. And uh, Ecclesiastes says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And then it says, a time to break down and a time to build up. You guys, you need to take vacations. I've said this before, and I'll say it again is vacations are so important for us to be able to stay in the ebbs and flows of life and to be able to really have our, our tanks refilled. And if we don't take that time, what, what it really does is it, it causes us to be disconnected sometimes to God and to be disconnected to our families. And, but when we take time away as a family and we spend concentrated time together and where there's no distractions, it really does help you to reconnect. And that with Wade being gone for nine months and being able to get away for a week like that, it was really a, a blessing for Jane and I to be able to have our family back together again. Now, it's interesting that Jane and I, a couple years ago, we were in Canyon City, the, the board there says, Kirk, you guys need to get disability insurance for Kirk in, in case something would happen to him, like the crazy things he does. And... So Jane started doing some research, and she called insurance companies, and they said, you know, pastors are the least, uh, I don't know, they don't want to insure pastors, because pastors have a very high rate of heart attacks, of strokes, of diseases of various kinds, because it's such a stressful job. And I go, really? And they said, yeah. They said, there are very few companies that will actually insure a pastor. I go, wow, why did I get into this field? <laughs> but I started thinking about why are pastors such a high risk? Now, one of the things that uh, we see in, in churches is that the expectations on the pastor are so high that it messes with the pastor's head, and so he just feels like he always has to be on 24-7. And so some of you may feel like if the senior pastor isn't the one who's preaching that weekend, then you really aren't having church. Right? I've heard that. But what happens is, a pastor will just shoot off like a pop out of rocket with all this sparks and fanfare, and then pretty soon he just runs out of steam and he fizzles and falls to the ground in a rapid decline. And so what Jane and I have learned over being involved in the ministry for so many years is we have to pace ourselves. We have to be the tortoise and not the hare. And one of the things that we have been committed to is that we do make vacations a priority for our family. And I, I have no apologies for that. And so when I'm gone and someone says, he's on vacation again? The reason I'm on vacation is so I can stay here. And um, the problem that many pastors have is when they don't do that, what happens is they, for the sake of the ministry, they lose their families. For the sake of the ministry, they lose their own health. For the sake of the ministry, they don't eat right, they don't exercise, and they don't even spend time in the Word and praying because they're so busy doing ministry. No wonder the life expectancy of a pastor is so short. 
So I just want to make a commitment to you guys. If I'm going to serve here for the long haul, we are committed, first and foremost, besides our relationship with Christ, is we put a, a highest priority on my relationship with Jane as my wife and with my family. That I just need to do that. I need those times to get my tanks refilled. And uh, the other thing is I'm really committed to be a coaching pastor. And what a coaching pastor does is he allows other guys to play. And so that's why I share the pulpit with people, is I share the pulpit because not only do they get to grow in learning the ministry of preaching, but you guys get to hear different things from different people in a different way, and I think God speaks to them, th through them, to us in a different way. I think it's just healthy for a church. If you only heard me speaking, you guys would be in a lot of trouble. I think seeing what happened with Paul Watson over the last three years and the number of years that he was in youth ministry, Paul has become very effective in public speaking and preaching. And so Paul's very prepared to go and do our satellite campus downtown. I'm so excited for what God's going to do through him. But these things of, of uh, vacations, we also need what I think are spiritual retreats. And a spiritual retreat is where you get away from the main and the plain. You get away from your usual environment, and you allow yourself to be in the presence of God and encounter God in a different way. We've got 40-something uh, adults right now at the Cleansing Stream Retreat in Colorado Springs. And I think when you see these guys come back, you're going to see different people because of how God speaks through that retreat. But... Retreats are one of those things where we go to God and we say, God, give me some vision. God, speak to me. God, renew me. God, restore me. It may be going away to a cabin in the mountains by yourself. It may be just sitting by the Colorado River for an hour and just taking that time to be in the presence of God. We all need to do that. Did you know that Jesus did that? In fact, Jesus, in Mark 9... He went on a little retreat. He took three of his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and he said, okay, guys, we're going to climb that mountain. And as they climb the mountain, they go up onto the mountain to experience God in a new way. So as we look at this, you like how I kind of segue into the message there? As we go into this, let's pray for God to speak to us. Can we do that? Can we pray in church? Okay, I just need your permission. God, we thank you that uh, you take us on these spiritual journeys. We thank you, Lord, that you speak to us in our regular daily routine, but there are those moments that you need to just take us away. And and as you take us away, you, you, we encounter you in a, in a unique way, and you, and you speak to us in, in a way that maybe we're just not able to hear you. And so as we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, I, I pray that we would see how we can grow in our faith in seeing the life and ministry of our Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to look at what's called the transfiguration. This is a retreat on steroids. <laughs> All right? This is a mega retreat that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John on. You go to Mark 9. For those of you that may be here as our guest today, what we're doing is going through a series on the book of Mark. And we hope by the end of the year we may get close to finishing it. In verse 1, it says, And he said to them, that's Jesus, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, this is really important for us to hear what Jesus is saying here. And so I want you to read this with me. Read this first verse with me. That means you read it out loud with me. Okay, I want to hear you. 
Turn to your neighbor and say, he wants to hear you now. So if you can read English, read along with me. And he said to them, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. The kingdom of God come with power. Holy smokes. That verse just says it all. It's all like, it's kind of like, okay, let's just pray and go home now. But he's setting these guys up. This is like a movie trailer. This is where he's giving them a precursor of what's to come. He said, guys, in the next few hours, dudes, pay attention. Because what you're going to see, guys, it's going to smoke your mind. This is just going to blow you out of the chute, and this is going to change your life. This is where your faith, guys, is going to grow because you're going to see the kingdom of God come with power. Be ready. And so with that kind of expectancy, let's go on and see what happens. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain. We actually, on our tour of Israel, we went right to the base of that mountain and looked up. And I just imagined Jesus up there with Peter, James, and John. Where they were all alone. There, was, there he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anything in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking to him. All of a sudden, Jesus is, woo! He just starts glowing like a thousand-watt light bulb. Now, mind you, at this time and age, the only light that they have seen is a candle, is a oil-burning lamp. That's one candlelight power for those of you that are into physics kind of stuff. Here, we got a thousand-watt light bulb. He just, whoo, he's just shining brightly. Even his clothes are like candescent. And I love what Peter does because all of a sudden these two dudes appear out of nowhere right next to Jesus. There's Elijah and there's Moses, and they're having this conversation. And Peter looks at him and he goes, oh, my gosh. And look at verse 5. He says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Have you ever been so afraid? You're just going, ah, you just say the stupidest things. <laughs> it's like the first time I talked to my father-in-law to ask him if I could marry his daughter. <laughs> but as he's doing that, Suddenly, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. If you were there, would that get your attention? All of a sudden, a cloud comes and a voice from heaven saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. You know, if I was Peter, I would have done the same thing. Jesus, this is awesome, man. I'm going to go down to Sportsman's Warehouse. I'll just get three tents, and we'll just set them up here. And we'll just live it forever, man. Forget the people down there. This is where the kingdom is. Holy cow. But Jesus does an incredible thing. As they were coming down the mountain, they didn't stay up there. He probably had a little conversation with Peter, puts his arm around Peter. Peter, I appreciate your zeal, bro. It would be nice to stay up here, but you know what? All the people I love are down in the valley. Let's go back down. And that's the whole thing about the value of a retreat, of getting away, of having that mountaintop experience with God is he's teaching us, 
He's equipping us. He's preparing us to go back down into the valley. Because down in the valley is where the people he loved are. Down in the valley is where God wants to use us to fulfill the kingdom purposes that he's called each and every one of us to fulfill. Did you know that every one of you has a kingdom purpose? Turn to the person behind you and say, you have a kingdom purpose. That's funny because you're all looking back and you're not hearing the guy in front of you. (laughs) I set you up for that, didn't I? But this is the kingdom of God mandate. He said, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. This is the prophet Elijah Why then it is written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected. Again, he's setting them up. He's letting them know that he has come for the purpose of dying. But I tell you, Elijah has come through who? John the Baptist. Baptist. Give that person a free cup of coffee. And they have done to him everything they wish, just as is written about him, that John the Baptist was beheaded because he proclaimed the kingdom. But the question is, and this is what I really want us to grab hold of today, wrap your minds around this, I want you to understand what it means when Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. I want you to understand what this means in our theology and in our practice as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. You guys, this is so important. And I'm going to have the folks in the worship team come forward and help me with this illustration. What we need to understand is that when Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, that something changed in the course of history. But we need to understand what limits there are to the kingdom right now. And we're going to use these uh, wonderful folks to help us to understand here. Now, first of all, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we're going to have our friend here hold up the sign that says creation. In Genesis 2.2, it says, By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work and blessed the seventh day and made it holy.